Okay, so here we are and yeah, fantastic discussion. So I'll maybe uh, hand over to uh, Karen first because you're working on this wonderful summit at the moment. And if you can introduce Tim to this, then Tim can probably tell you where he's coming from, what uh, his college is doing. And then we're into, yeah, I think uh, open territory and we'll see where it leads us. Sounds great. Uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, happy to be here with all of you and, um, and working alongside such amazing advocates, educators, and professionals across the world. Um, I'm Karen Tim. Um, I am, um, uh, my pronouns are she, her, first of all. Um, and I should say that I am a white woman with um, currently uh, wavy hair, a gray and red uh, headband gray shirt and my background currently is a wood wall with um, um, a white a black a black tree uh, burn etched into a wood um, uh, plank portrait page I don't know what you'd call it it's a board it's a, it's a anyway um, I am the um, a school administrator in um, the GTA in Ontario in uh, Greater Toronto area and a board called the Durham District School Board. Um, I've been an administrator for a, a number of years. Um, I recently, over the last, um, I guess it's been in the last couple of years, um, I decided to uh, seek out, uh, well, not seek out, I, I had a formal diagnosis of, of uh, being autistic uh, for, I guess, about five years and um, had been masking so, so much, didn't even still, I'm still peeling back those layers, uh, but I, I do use um, identity first language uh, as a member of the autistic community. And I chose to start introducing myself that, that way um, in school board meetings, as well as with my staff. And that was a really huge um, step for me because there have been systemic barriers and obstacles throughout the, um, the journey, certainly, but um, it's, been, it's been an interesting journey and it will continue. And uh, now it's about connecting with uh, people from around the world to compare what's going on in different systems um, and how we don't need to be reinventing the wheel, right? We should be reinventing all of the wheels um, together and learning from each other. Um, so in any case, um, that, oh, and most importantly, I always say I am mom to a very amazing, detail-oriented, brilliant, autistic human. Thank you. So, Tim? Hey, welcome, Stellan. Um, Hi. Thanks for sharing, Karen. It's so great to get that perspective. Um, and I guess, yeah, just to get started, I use, typically use uh, he, him pronouns. I'm okay with they, them pronouns as well. Uh, so whichever you prefer. Um, I have been in and out of the mental health system throughout much of my life. I've never received a formal diagnosis that seemed to kind of fit with who I am. So I broadly consider myself neurodivergent, but um, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. That's why I think community can be so important. So I can learn about other people's experiences and understand, especially you know, people who are educators like myself, like some of the obstacles they've gone through. Um, and like you said, the importance of um, using identity first language when it comes to how you navigate these social spaces and, and what effect that can have. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I work at a, I work and teach at a school called Landmark College. Um, I've been here for three years. I'm still learning a lot about the college myself. Uh, it's got a long history, well, relatively long history before I've gotten here. It started uh, from what I understand in the mid 1970s um, as a college that catered primarily to uh, dyslexic students. And it was based largely on a special education model then. Um, over the years, the student population has continued to grow and include, uh, I think that the first major change was to include students formally diagnosed with ADHD. And then there was a move later on to include autistic students and students with other uh, diagnoses or, or, or other uh, who, have, who have gone through other types of assessment that would seem to indicate that they could use extra support that we can offer at Landmark. In the last few years, we've moved away from that. 
And so we're, we're no longer using diagnostic criteria or assessment tools as a basis for uh, admittance into Landmark. Um, but as an institution, there's still a lot of questions about what that means and, and how does that influence our identity. So the neurodiversity model emerged as a way for us to try to make sense of what we're doing at Landmark, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And around 10 years ago, Landmark adopted, started to adopt this language for themselves to try to, to make sense of and market what it is that we do. But in terms of how that affects our everyday realities, that's still, there's still, I think, a lot of contestation there. And so uh, I'm approaching this both as an educator, but also someone who's you know, learning more about himself through the neurodiversity movement. Uh, and I've learned so much about myself through the students that I've met here and the students that I've worked with. I'll say that amongst the students, there's a really strong neurodiversity culture and that's continuing to grow. Now that we have four year programs, we have more students who are here um, you know, longer than a year or two. So that culture gets a little bit more time to develop. Um, and as more students start to make connections outside of the college and start to learn more about the neurodiversity movement, I've seen you know, a lot of growth happen in terms of developing a neurodiversity culture. Uh, it may be something like a burgeoning autistic culture here, but again, I think a lot of this is still in the process of, of, of being developed. And so, um, yeah, a lot, lot of frustration still here, given all the different ways of talking and thinking about the students we work with and also ourselves. Um, I think there's, there's, a, there's um, more acceptance in terms of neurodiversity amongst our, our students than our faculty. And so that's why I'm also excited to hear more about your experiences with that. I think in theory, everyone's open to it, but practically speaking with, with the institutional demands and like what's expected out of faculty, I think that it's not always mirrored. The same, same type of ideas aren't always mirrored towards our faculty that, are, that we reflect towards our students. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here and learn from others' perspectives and how they've navigated with these spaces as well. So thanks, Jorn, for inviting us. Yeah, thank you, Tim. This is wonderful context. So framing um, the whole uh, education sector um, uh, in terms of uh, well, what it, what the new diversity paradigm can perhaps mean. Uh, maybe um, before uh, handing over to to the further participants, I'll just briefly <laughs> introduce myself. So. Uh, I'm originally from, from Germany. Uh, I'm uh, 55 years old, so from a time where uh, autistic ways of being, I think, were completely unfamiliar to, to most people. So I've also never received any sort of diagnoses. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I grew up uh, at the ocean um, in, in Nigeria, actually, uh, as a child. And um, so uh, I, I was never sort of, I never felt at home anywhere uh, geographically or with my family. And um, so now I moved to, to Aotearoa, New Zealand um, over 25 years ago. And because yeah, it's close to the ocean. So my home is effectively the ocean. And I relate very much to uh, the, the way that the, the indigenous people here uh, relate to, to their way of being. They're very attached to the land and to the oceans and, and, and to the mountains here. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and I bailed out of uh, traditional um, employment um, over 20 years ago because it was not survivable. Um, and what, uh, so I've been aware of being autistic probably for around 10 years. Um, and um, at the time, yeah, 20 years ago, uh, I created a small company together with a friend because uh, we wanted to do something different. We knew we weren't really employable. 10 years ago, we created what you could call a, a worker-owned cooperative, uh, non-hierarchical, uh, building on the awareness of what it means to be autistic uh, in terms of yeah, not accepting the social structures um, uh, around us. And so what I've been focusing on more and more in the last, over the last three years is how do we, how can we address the roots 
causes, the, the fundamental things that are wrong in our society, because I don't believe anything is wrong with autistic people or neurodivergent people. It's just that we are these often these, these hypersensitive people that uh, just uh, notice how inhumane uh, and dehumanizing our society has become. Um, and uh, so there are two, I think, important domains or, or disciplines um, that are worthwhile focusing on and that I'm now focusing on. One is the healthcare sector where within the people around me uh, have lots of domain expertise and we're building great allies. Um, and the reason why the healthcare sector is so important in terms of changing the paradigm is because it's via GPs and pediatricians that uh, many parents uh, and also children get exposed to neurodivergence. And if that first encounter is framed in this negative way, oh, you seem to have a, a child that may be autistic and you, you better think about you know, having an early intervention. I mean, that, raises the alarm bells with the parents that that basically leads them directly into the stigma. And then it makes people vulnerable to the heavy advertisements from the um, whole autism industrial complex. So this is highly dangerous and we actually need to work against this. And what I find is that actually in the healthcare sector, well, many autistic people are attracted to that sector. I mean, they, many of them are great clinicians because they've, got this ability to uh, dig deep into a domain and become specialists. So all these undercover clinicians, I think, they're actually on our side, right? If we uh, engage with them in the right kind of way. Um, and similarly, of course, what I don't need to explain to, to you uh, is that um, then the education system is also, it's, it's largely an indoctrination system, right? In our cultural paradigm. And so that's why education is the, the next big topic where I think we need to look at the fundamentals. Well, what are we actually teaching our children? I mean, and, and uh, um, yeah, there's a, a wonderful project um, that um, my partner and um, wife uh, initiated uh, about the uh, um, basically having presenting autistic communities in public libraries. Uh, so that's uh, about just raising some initial knowledge uh, about new divergence and autistic ways of being to the general public so that people can come across this topic again in a sort of just public setting completely ideally you know, non-pathologizing uh, so that people realize hey there's a whole culture there there's <laughs> these are people that can collaborate that are doing things uh, it's and maybe raise awareness well, I mean, we need to go far beyond awareness in terms of autistic culture, but uh, raising awareness about um, how sick our society is. Um, so, and I begin, um, Quinn, for you to talk about your perspective, because amongst all of us, you've probably been, uh, well, fully aware of uh, autistic ways of being for the longest amongst all of us. Uh, so, uh, yeah, please uh, tell us uh, what your experience has been over the decades. Okay. Um, by way of introduction, yeah, I'm Quinn. Um, if anybody knows my face, it's because I run the Autistomatic channel on YouTube. Um, when I say run, I do everything. Um, yeah, I was diagnosed as autistic back in the 1980s um, at a time when there was no autism spectrum. Um, I didn't get on very well in education. Um, and I can honestly say that I hated every teacher that I ever had, with one or two exceptions. And it's quite shocking that so many of my friends now are teachers. Um, it goes to prove that you can't judge books by their covers. Um, I was sent to an educational psychologist at the age of uh, nearly 13 um, because I didn't get on very well in school. I went to a selective school, grammar school, as they, they're called over here. Um, at 11 years old, I did the 11 plus, which is very similar to those IQ tests. 
Um, it's all verbal reasoning kind of stuff. And I scored extremely well and was streamed off to a selective school, which I hated with a passion. Um, as soon as they had me labelled as being clever or gifted, they started pushing heavy pressure on me that I really didn't need, didn't want, and I didn't conform. So I was sent to an education, the educational psychologist. Um, after months and months of weekly appointments, uh, the guy washed his hands of me. But a younger person who had recently qualified took me over and he'd read Lorna Wing's work. And he recognised that the way I presented was what he then described as the Asperger type of autism. That was something my family weren't particularly keen on. Uh, my father actually ripped up the referral letter and burned it uh, and said, no expletive son of mine has got that expletive wrong with him. Um, I tended to say nothing about it for much of my young life, um, especially after 1988 when Rain Man came around and the people that I had confided in suddenly started emptying boxes of matches in front of me and going, go on, count them. So uh, I kind of clammed up. So I went for a good 10 or more years telling nobody, didn't even tell my partners until a partner of mine um, worked it out for herself and I confided in her and that led to the end of that relationship. A couple of years ago, because of an incident in my workplace, I decided that I'd had enough and I was going to start fighting back. So I stopped masking, I stopped pretending, I stopped avoiding the subject and just embraced it. Uh, I started the channel um, as something I wrote for somebody today. I wrote, wrote it with the intention, of, so I started it with the intention of educating people and ended up learning more than I ever expected. I've met some amazing people. Um, I've realised that this community of ours that some people even now are quite afraid of is actually one of the warmest, most embracing communities that I could imagine. Um, I very rarely find anybody that I don't get on with reasonably well, if not fantastically well. And the unity of purpose amongst not only autistic, but the whole neurodivergent community as a whole is tremendous. There's a real appetite for change and people willing to work for it. Uh, it's very telling that most of the people that I work with, including a lot of you guys here, do it for no direct reward. You either do it as, as, as something within the job that you do, or we do it just because we want to make a difference. And yes, you do get neurotypical people who do the same thing, but there's not the same sense of unity. There's not the same sense of commonality. And I think the, the one thing that's very special about neurodivergent people and autistic people in particular is that when we get together we recognize that commonality we communicate in a way that we can't communicate with anybody else and it makes it not only much easier but it makes it a really welcoming experience um, i would like to see that expanded beyond just other people who are like us i'd like to think that we could engage with neurotypical people and other non-autistic neurodivergence just as easily as we do with each other. But we need to go a long way in terms of understanding and acceptance to actually get to that point. Um, the last time I did a, a video with a, um, an awareness month theme, I suggested that awareness had failed, that acceptance wasn't doing terribly well, but what we need to do is engage. And that's where we're starting to move to now we're starting to get people to engage with us and actually listen to us rather than just dictate to us we've got little crumbs at the moment and we've got to build on them and really make it into something that makes a, a difference in this world it's not necessarily about us here certainly not myself and yawn both being in our 50s but for the children that are growing up now and children yet to be born I want them to have a better world a more accepting world than the one that we grew up in and I think we are finally after all these years starting to make some progress towards that that's my intro done brilliant thank you and I think this uh, also I think um, maybe explains uh, why we need to well it adds to why we need to look at 
society. And when it comes to diagnosis, we need to actually cultivate a kind of language where we can diagnose problems within society rather than problems with individual people. Because in the end, I think what uh, we are struggling with is the relationships or the kind of ways of relating to each other um, that uh, are dictated to us by society, which we find dehumanizing. And I think this is where uh, what my experience is in particular with uh, in the autistic community and also as Quinn is saying, you know, with, with other neurodivergent people, um, we uh, tend to notice these details. We tend to find it weird uh, what our society is telling us, how we should relate to people. And if we um, free ourselves from um, these cultural expectations, we naturally gravitate to alternative ways of uh, relating to each other, working with each other that are actually, uh, well, much less traumatizing to us. So a very interesting topic that um, I'm uh, digging into together with uh, further um, activists and, 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 and dear friends and colleagues and partners is this topic of autistic trauma, um, which, uh, yeah, we are, most of us are highly traumatized. Uh, and this starts, uh, or is, is really, we, we are starting to be traumatized by the education system very heavily, and of course, our parents and, and, and families. So, uh, there's, yeah, and I think as Quinn is saying, I think it will take quite a, quite a time for, for these things to change and it can't start soon enough. So um, uh, it's great to see uh, Stellan here as well. So we've all introduced each other uh, to each other. Um, Stellan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um... I'm Stellan, I use he, him pronouns. I am a student at Landmark. So um, I have done a lot of work in the Landmark Center for Neurodiversity with Tim and also has like, been one of my professors. Um, and I, I mean, as as a kid, I um, didn't really know about any like diagnoses that I had and um, kind of went through school being like, well, this isn't really, uh, this wasn't made for me, but I guess I'll like figure it out and not really loving it so much, but liking to learn and like wishing that it was made differently. Um, and then eventually, um, like I went to college and I was doing very badly and I did some testing and I was diagnosed with um, ADHD and social anxiety, which I think was a, the, some, what they, what they diagnosed, what I would now recognize as like being autistic. Um, and so as being a student at Landmark and knowing autistic people, I kind of came to um, see that I was very much like those people. And then I was like, oh, it's because we're the same. So that's a little bit of um, that. Um, I don't know what else is relevant. Um, and I, I'm graduating at the end of the semester. Um, so I'll be leaving Landmark. Then. But um, I hope to still be involved with like the neurodiversity movement and autistic culture for a really long time. So. Thank you very much. I, I, I think it's fair to say, Stellan, that if you're part of it now, you'll always be part of it unless you choose to take your leave, as it were, and not want yeah. to be part of it. Um, I mean, myself, I've dipped in and out of the um, online autistic community because it really is the internet that's brought us all together um, for, well, a good 25 years or so. Back in the late 90s was when I first started engaging with other autists online. And there have been times when I've 
left it all together because there have been some difficult things going on either within the community or within my own life but I've never seen it as cohesive as it is now um, I've never seen such a desire or will for change as I do now so from our point of view it's potentially quite an exciting time because there is so much happening so many people are becoming aware um, we have a phenomenon now in the last few years that we've never had before and that's the possibility of self-identification self-diagnosis and what people are identifying with is not this um, autism triad of impairments. People are not coming along and saying, oh, yeah, I, I, I don't get on with anybody and I, I don't like people and I, I far prefer going to museums and theatres. Uh, no, they're going, hang on, these people I'm talking to, they think like I do. They made the same connections that I did. They have the same view of the, the, the lack of of understanding of or logic of particular things, that some things make perfect sense to them that nobody else seems to understand. That's something that we never had before. The, the, the people 20 years ago who were coming together had diagnoses, and very often we had those diagnoses because of people having very dim views of us. But the people who are identifying themselves as being or potentially being autistic, depending on how they wish to approach it, um, have not identified with a whole series of faults and deficits. They've identi identified with a way of sensing the world, of perceiving the world and of processing information. And that to me says volumes about why the subject of tonight's discussion, replacing the deficit ridden DSM and ICD with a neurodiversity center paradigm, one which looks at us as uh, a particular strain or strand of humanity rather than being uh, a faulty, um, in some way incomplete set of people. We're clearly not, because when we get together, we have the most amazing conversations, uh, group conversations or one-on-one. -on -one. We can talk about things that we are passionate about ourselves and other people will sit and listen and be interested in what we're here to say. Whereas in normal conversation, everybody will be going, oh, when's he gonna shut up? I've had enough of this. So uh, I see that there is something different about us all that we have in common, despite the infinite variety there is amongst us. We have this way of seeing and thinking that unites us. Now, if we can recognize that between ourselves and people can self-identify based on that, why can't we expand that so that we actually throw these diagnostic manuals in the bin, at least as far as autism is concerned, and move forward to something which is more based on identity and thought and feeling. Um, the video I've got coming out later on tonight is about the phrase on the spectrum. Um, a lot of people use it as a, as a lightweight way of saying autistic. Other people use it as an insult. Um, it's a bit of a controversial phrase. But I, I, I mention in it, we don't ask people to be diagnosed over their political beliefs or their sexuality or their religion. Why are we diagnosing people with autism? Why are we not hauling people up and saying, so why do you believe that you should have way more than everybody else? You've got a fault in your brain. You should want to share like it. No, we don't. We just say, oh, well, he's right wing. Somebody else may believe that everything should be completely shared equally amongst everybody. And we don't say that they've got a mental disorder of any kind. We just say, yeah, they're left wing. We have people who fight each other over minor differences of belief in a particular religious book. We don't call them mad, neurodivergent, anything. We just say they believe something different. Their minds work a different way. They have a different value system and way of seeing the world. I don't see we should really be seen as much different from that. Rant over. Yeah, uh, this is excellent. Um, this uh, uh, chimes in what I uh, often refer to the hyper normality in our society. Um, so the what is and it's it's fascinating that uh, I, I think the extent to which people even refer to the term normal. Right, and with the pandemic, I mean, we see this again. We want to get back to normal. I mean, what what is this normal? It's 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 like an obsession, uh, and this is what I think you can very clearly trace this to the very beginnings of, of the industrial era, 
And um, over the last um, 10 years, roughly, yeah, for the same sort of period where I started to become aware of being autistic and, and then learned about this, well, for that period, I really shifted my attention to society and, and learning about, well, where are humans coming from? And um, the, the modern social sciences I found actually can't teach us very much because they're so steeped in the Western cultural bias. And we need to move far beyond that. And I think in order to push the new diversity movement forward, we need to leave behind the Western social sciences. And so there, and I found two ways of learning things far beyond that. And one is to uh, dig deep and learn more from an anthropological perspective, looking at the entire human evolutionary history over the last you know, several hundred thousand years. Because let's face it, I mean, uh, these so-called civilizations that we've built over the last 10,000 years, well, that's a very recent period. And actually it's a highly unstable period so far. No so-called civilization has survived for very long, right? In terms of, on, on the evolutionary scale. And so these hi hierarchical empires that have, well, that's basically this, what you could call a bubble economics or <laughs> it's, it's a constant up and down. It's highly volatile. It's destructive, competitive. This is not where we're coming from. I mean, if you look at the, the broader history, what you actually find out is that humans stand out from other primates because we've realized the limitations of these hierarchical um, systems of, um, well, working together or living together. I mean, that's where some other primates, I mean, have, have their limits in terms of what they can do. Humans became so successful and could occupy all these ecos ecosystems on the planet because we are so adaptive, because we realize that actually uh, by collaborating and clamping down on um, these competitive ways of being, um, we can achieve much more and we can actually uh, thrive and even help entire ecosystems thrive beyond the, the human sphere. And this is, of course, a framing that, uh, well, is if you think this through, it's, it's a highly political topic, right? And so you can see how our society is pushing back heavily against uh, all of this. Um, the, uh, so anthropology, I, I think, is really important. And then what's fascinating here in Aotearoa is um, the, the Maori communities and the Maori cultures, and I'm using the plural because it's not just one culture. I mean, there are all these different cultures here in the Pacific um, where, um, yes, I mean, those are, you know, in, in evolutionary terms, those are also modern culture, but they're still what I would consider human scale. So uh, these the, the Maori societies and Maori communities are much smaller scale than these bigger empires that we have elsewhere. And in that sense, they've got many, many practices that are much more, I think, understandable and relatable to, to humans uh, and, and practices that are less, I would say, traumatizing. And so, for example, these pathologizing labels that we use that are embedded in the DSM, I mean, not, nothing of that kind exists in, in these cultures and we need to make people aware of this. So. We can work with indigenous cultures and with the anthropological knowledge and maybe even archaeological knowledge that we have at our disposal to really push back against this sick society. And that's, I would say, to push the movement, we need to start being explicit about uh, all the things that are wrong with society and to say, no, this is not about politics. This is about something more fundamental. Yeah, you and I, I love it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Karen, sorry. It's okay, it's all right. Um, you know, I just, I, I think of neurodiversity and, and all those things that you were just talking about. And I love that, um, that whole idea of it being a variation of the human genome, um, you know, it, it is to me something that um, really helps uh, families when we're having conversations with families, because um, as, as an educator, as a leader, I, I have the, the, honor and privilege to be able to be on that journey with so many families and, and little people as they're discovering more about themselves. And 
um, and I'm talking pre and post diagnosis and some who choose the diagnostic route, route and some who don't um, and some who maybe will never get there and, and some who, you know, waver back and forth. And, um, but I think back to a video that, um, that Quinn did about eye contact and that whole idea of what is culturally norm, uh, what, what's, what's normal, what is acceptable, what, what I mean, that whole idea of normal um, is, is not limited to um, what's considered diagnostic criteria. And so when we make parallels to cultural differences, um, like you were saying, Yorn, and we think about um, over time, um, and again, over time across the world in different ways, uh, things have been considered normal. That idea of normal has changed. And so, you know, it, it's not that long ago that women were allowed to vote, <laughs> right? It's not that long ago that certain cultures, certain skin colors were not even considered human. It's not that long ago until at least where I am, um, you know, people who identified as gay, non-binary, it's, it's her, like anything that was non-cis um, was considered like, in some cases illegal, right? But also um, abnormal. And it was in the diagnostics, like to me that blows me away. And so I think that um, although I would never want to um, make parallels with any other group who has been so significantly marginalized over history, um, I, I think we do have to see this as a next step on our journey as neurodivergent people because um, there, there have been people walking these paths in, with, you know, putting different shoes on and in different clothes and all around the world um, for time and time again. Um, but what has brought us together is that neurodivergent people, I feel, have always been there on those journeys. Because if we think back to who, who was being burnt at the stake, who was being, you know, executed, who was being considered, you know, it's not okay to think that the world is, you know, not flat. Like all of these um, ideas that people have been criticized for, all of these, um, you know, obsessions that have got us things like, you know, the internet that have got us to explore new ways of thinking, new ways of communicating. Um, and so those forward thinkers, those outside of the box people, um, for forever. I mean, were, was a neurodivergent, you know, Australopithecus, like, you know, the, were, were they the, per, the first one to do something that suddenly took us into a ne the next stage of human development? And I don't know, but I think we have to be thinking about neurodivergency as something that is natural. It is part of what is normal. Um, and we may only be a small segment of the population, although I'd argue that we're a lot more than people realize. Um, I, I think that there's a reason it's because we're a variation, but it doesn't mean we're a bad variation, right? That whole idea, different, not less. Um, and in many cases, I think a whole lot more, but the society systemic um, structures are not built for the minority ever. Yeah, thanks. And, and again, we, we can frame it in, in, in the broadest possible sense. I, I don't think, for example, that neurodivergence is something that um, evolved, that it, I don't even see it as being limited to, to our species. It's, we simply underestimate how diverse um, life is. And so we've always been that diverse. The only thing that's changed is that we can, uh, with our capacity for culture, once culture sort of goes in a way that is incompatible with human ways of being, then these cultures become restrictive and um, they force, or well, they create pressures. Uh, and then suddenly some people um, get considered not normal. And so, and cultural, well, what is culture? It's about social norms, right? I mean, this is where, so, and what's, if you look from an anthropological perspective, um, the most, uh, well, the, the main cultural norms that we used to have before we built these empires were cultural norms um, against um, people exerting systematic power over other people. 
right? So these permanent power gradients, those things were clamped down on. So the historically over the long term, cultures, uh, the, the commonalities across cultures were very simple. It, it's those types of that was the, the most important cultural norm. Everything else are cultural practices that are deeply tied into the, the local context, understanding the local ecosystem, how all that works. And you relate not only to other people, but all the things in that environment, whether it's human, non-human, living, non it's, it's even, you know, uh, these things that today we wouldn't even consider living. I mean, for people traditionally, many of those things were just as alive and important as, as um, and I think we really need to peel back all these layers of indoctrination that our society has given us, right? All these institutions that we live with, that, what, what, what are schools, right? So we have institutions, uh, what else? Uh, oh yeah, our, our whole life, right? Um, so going to school and jobs, uh, job markets. Um, and then we have institutions like marriage. And, and we talk even about marriage markets. <laughs> oh, what is it? It's hilarious. Um, and then the economists, I mean, they develop these abstract models and think they understand humans. I mean, it's, it's, it's increasingly bizarre, I think. And how we measure success. And yes. that's tied to all of those, isn't it, right? Because um, a, a big thing for me this year, we talk about co continually co-learning and, and, and digging deeper, um, you know, and communication and that variety of communication and what's considered acceptable and not acceptable, but also forms of communication and the idea of presuming competence. And, um, you know, uh, too often people are presumed to not have anything to say or that they're intellectually they're, they're perceived to be intellectually inferior because they don't use mouth speak and mm -hmm. and the, the 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 movement to hashtag listen to non-speakers exists because it is such um a, a fallacy that people who don't use mouth speak don't have anything to say they are oftentimes more often than not um, you know, taking in so much and, and developing these amazing um, ideas and thoughts and can become some of the most amazing writers and, and musicians and, you know, you name it across professions, um, but are so underserved because our systems don't meet the needs of those who do not uh, who are not seen to communicate successfully. It's like if you were walking with a non-speaker or moving around or communicating and a non-speaker was there, people don't necessarily default to communicating with the non-speaker. It's like they look to the quote aid, even though the aid may not be um, an aid at all. It may be a partner, it may be a, a child, it may be a student. And so that assumption, that default that we have that mouth speak is this be all and end all, um, I think is is something that we need to pursue um, more, certainly in education, but but across fields. Because how often do we hear about um, problems with interacting with law enforcement because of stimming or different ways of communicating, right? And add on the layers of you know culture and skin color, et cetera, and then that that obviously compounds the, the marginalization that our, our neurodivergent uh, community uh, faces when they're interacting with anybody in power. But in education, same thing. In the medical field, same mm -hmm. thing. There's, there's just so much. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. No, this is really important. I think that you bring up this topic of mouth speak. And I mean, actually, the oral part of human culture is, is, is really important um, or evolutionary. But uh, even going all the way back, um, we've always had other people. So it's also ironic in the civilized world, right? When people tell us that uh, we developed written language, what is it, uh, 6,000 years ago or something like that. But actually, if you look at the um, indigenous cultures in, in Australia, for example, right? I mean, we've got um, visual languages that are tens of thousands of years old. And so, well, guess who developed those, right? So we've probably always had people who uh, knew that, uh, and who actually, well, didn't only use mouth speak, right? And we 
put this to good use. We put these visual languages to good use as well. And so that's, we've been doing this for tens of thousands of years, leaving marks on rocks that actually survive over thousands of years. And together with the oral, way, oral traditions, we've come up with ways of transmitting knowledge, local ecological knowledge with high fidelity over thousands of years. And we've, in a, in a way, our ways of collaborating and communicating in civilizations have been dumbed down where we've shifted the emphasis so much on, yeah, I mean, we are abusing mouth speak for sort of ways of manipulation and deceiving others, right? And uh, we've uh, shifted the emphasis of um, written language again to sort of persuasive writing. And we make that very explicit even in the school cur cur curriculum. And I find this highly concerning. Um, another uh, interesting aspect where we can see that the hypernormalization is running into real sort of limits and resistance is if I look at, you know, uh, the diversity of genders that we're now seeing, I think what is actually happening here is people are pushing back against the bizarre concept of culturally constructed gender, right? And um, so, yeah, uh, and from my perspective, I actually, gender is like the, the most well, I, I don't identify with any gender. The whole concept doesn't make sense, right? So if they're um, called a gender or the null gender, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's I, I realize that this is such a cultural construct that doesn't need to exist at all. Um, and um, it's again, a desire to, well, if you construct things like gender, you can construct cultural norms and then impress that over, these norms over the population and it's a natural desire at least to broaden the well to come up with new kind of categories but ultimately i think we want to blow away all the categories the fixed categories right yeah, yeah. at the moment we're seeing that such a move towards increasing categorization particularly with our in our own sphere um all the talk of profound autism and the like um i i i had a, a comment somebody put on a video that I picked up on um, it was this morning, actually. Um, I did a video a couple of years ago about functioning labels. And it was somebody autistic saying that functioning labels are just words, aren't they? And they're words we need. The reason being that they had seen an employment agent who had said, OK, you're autistic. What kind of autistic? Well, I'm just autistic. I'll put high functioning then. No, you can't say that, they say. Why not? Uh, it, it, but you're obviously high functioning. And so I was asked, how are we supposed to tell people? That person who's filling out the form, this employment agent, hasn't got any idea what they mean by low functioning or severe or anything like this. What they actually mean is autistic plus something else. Autistic plus learning or intellectual disability. Autistic plus epilepsy. Autistic plus doesn't use verbal speech for some reason or another. There's so many reasons why people don't speak. Um, people who have meltdowns all the time and abscond or, 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 or self-harm, they're not severely autistic. They're autistic people who are under massive distress and are, are, are reacting because of it. All these things that we see as severe or um, extreme or low functioning are just people trying to categorize something that they don't understand and in many cases aren't willing to understand and I think that's a part of the problem we're facing with people accepting neurodiversity in the first place it's convenient to people to categorize other people uh, the, 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 there's two different ways of looking at the word normal one is almost a cliche, normal is what everybody else is, but you're not. But what most people's perception of normal really is, is I'm normal and anybody else that I regard as being like me is normal, but nobody else is. We've got two completely different views on it. But if we were to look at it from the, from the neurodiversity point of view, we've got all these designations for, for not being normal that we call neurodivergence. But who's written the definition of what a normal mind is? What, what, what DSM equivalent can you go through which will tell you the details of a normal, balanced, healthy mind? 
The only thing we've got to refer to is where somebody has said it's wrong. And it only takes a sufficiently prominent expert to say this is wrong and this is why. And there's a huge swathe of people that will just follow them. You know, when a certain shall remain nameless says, ah, empathy is the foundation of humanity. And these autistic people, they don't have any. Everybody follows. Ah, yeah, well, systemizing, extreme male brains, they all follow because that person saying it has sufficient credibility and status to be able to dictate that way. And all of a sudden, a, a whole huge group of people are not normal and in a very specific way just because of that person's credibility. But that idea of normal is based on nothing. Everybody thinks they know what normal is, but nobody will ever be able to define it. The only people who've ever speculated on what normal is are the philosophers and poets. But there are no doctors out there writing the manual of what is normal. Normal is simply not deficient by current and local standards. Mm. It's like I mean, Karen mentioned the eye contact earlier on. The, the standards of eye contact in um, the, the east of the world compared to the west of the world are completely different. I may be told that I'm not showing enough respect because I don't make eye contact. I could go over to, to a, a number of places, um, say China, Korea, and be thought of as being insolent because I was making eye contact. Those standards are cultural. They're not universal. Mm -hmm. And yet that difficulty making eye contact has been written into the DSM and the ICD as if that was a concrete, universal, human, normal standard. And it's clearly not. And until we can get past that, we're going to be fighting this battle. Now, before I started on this, I'd already committed to it. I think it was probably you, Tim, that was about to speak. Am I right? Yeah, it was, but you went down the same path that I was going to take. And so I'm glad that you went first. Because I was thinking <laughs> back to like my experiences working in a mental health agency with youth and families right after undergrad. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had a horrible training, but it was probably better training than most people had. And I got there and I remember thinking pretty early on that, wait, like the students' responses to the faculty actually make way more sense than what I've been learning in the training and what the faculty have been telling me, what they're telling me about their experiences and why and what they want to do and how they feel about the situation they're in makes so much more sense to me. It's so much more reasonable than what I've been told their diagnosis is and what I've been told is wrong with them. And so very quickly, I started to think, you know, pretty critically about what the DSM was, like, why are we using these categories to make sense of these people? And then I gradually started to identify with them much more. And I was like, wait, I feel much more comfortable around them than I do around most of the, the mental health workers that I was working for, working with and that they were, you know, and, and I think that the main thing that stood out to me, and that's why I like so much this idea that's been brought up several times about identifying problems in the in society rather than identifying problems in the individual, because what I found was that you know, many of these were young people from low-income backgrounds who, you know, had a lot of trauma in their history, and they had a whole range of diagnoses, like the most, you know, diverse range of diagnoses you can imagine. Um, but all of them struggled with one thing, and that was just feeling like they, they belonged and feeling like they were accepted in any type of community at all. And so there, there was violence there, but the violence was as I came to understand, a result of them not feeling like they were safe um, and not feeling like anyone was there to to keep them safe. And we didn't know what we were doing. We weren't, you know, we were just out of undergrad for, for the most of us, most of us. So we didn't know how to keep them safe. So it was a very violent and very, um, yeah, it was, I mean, I, I, I don't think I realized it at the time, but leaving there, I think I had a lot of trauma that I had to work through. Um, and I'm still trying to make sense of that. But I think what, what, what stood with me was the fact that we, we so often, and Stella, and you, you said this so beautifully during our talk the other day when we were presenting. So, so I think what I came, I came to realize about the DSM is that it takes all, all these wide ranging systemic issues and it collapses them down and tries to locate them with an ind individual person. And so, really throughout the history of psychiatry, we're really just blaming individual people for systemic issues because it's way easier to just isolate certain individuals that don't conform to the norm 
from everyone else than it is to actually change society at a structural level and make it a place where you know people actually feel supported and actually feel like you know they can be who they are. Um, and so now we have you know hundreds of, of diagnoses where we would have only had a handful at the beginning of psychiatry, but like maybe that is a result of like what we're talking about, the diversity of social institutions and the diversity of the problems that people are identifying continues to grow. And we really don't know as a society how to make sense of that diversity. So the boxes just keep getting, keep growing, right? Um, but yeah. well, This is the thing, I mean, we ourselves, we fall into a particular category. But the category wasn't made by us. It was made for us. It was made as a way of explaining a certain kind of what was considered deficient. deficiency, um, we would term a difference. But it was because it affected our place in society, in productive society, and productive is the word. Thinking back to what Jorn was saying earlier on, if you look at Maori cultures and Aboriginal cultures in Australia before um, we came along effectively, they were primarily hunter-gatherers. Pretty much every hunter-gatherer society that's been encountered, even ones that the, the few surviving ones now, when they're encountered, there's a bit of a shock for the Western observer. Because your average hunter-gatherer puts in about 15 hours a week. That's it. That's all it takes to gather all the nuts and berries and roots you need and to hunt the meat that you need. 15 hours a week is the average. And yet we're expected to work 40, generally as a minimum. And I know that in the US often that's an awful lot more is expected of people. We've come to celebrate that incredibly hard work, that drudgery as being uh, something to aspire to. It's honorable to slog your guts out for the boss. Yet, if you gave it all up and lived a hunter-gatherer existence, you'd only be working 15 or 20 hours. When Western explorers and um, scientists met these people, their attitude to them was by imposing their own standards and saying, well, a bunch of lazy buggers, we'll show them what real work's like, and try to bring them into our cultures. And there was understandable resistance, which lasts to this day. Because we were asking these people to do something which is entirely unnatural. It's not just a question of culture, it's actually working them too hard. There is an argument that if man were working, and I say man in the strictly humankind kind of terms, if we were all working 40 hours plus a week, we would never have evolved language or music or art or written language or education or have stories that have been passed on through generations, as Jorn was mentioning just now. These things wouldn't have happened because we would have had no spare time. We would have just exhausted ourselves. We would have been literally feeding machines. That would be all we did. Do our hunting, do our gathering, feed our face and go to sleep. That's not what happened. We evolved a civilization. But where it changed is where we started farming. Farming was one of the greatest things that changed humanity and it made societies possible. But it also introduced profit. And as soon as you introduce profit, you introduce an incentive to lie. And as soon as you introduce an incentive to lie, you've got crime. Everything that is wrong with our world today is, as going right back to the Bible and before, is because money is the root of all evil. As soon as somebody realizes that they can make a profit off somebody else's labor, then the corruption comes in and the need to label those who can't or don't want to participate. So if you have an objection and if you think there's an easier way of doing it, they don't want to know. That means that you're a deviant. That means that there's something wrong with you. If you don't want to play along or you want to work with other people to make things better, doesn't matter. If that gets in the way of me doing the things I want to and making money out of you, I'm not going to let you do it. And our whole concept of what's normal and what's admirable has come out of that. And yet we've got a world which is based on contradictions. I nearly got fired from a job for telling the truth when I've been told that I must always tell the truth. And when I complained, hey, all I did was tell the truth like you told me to. Yeah, but not that truth. Yeah, but it's the truth. And you told me to tell the truth. Yes, but you should know what's the truth that you tell and what's the truth that you keep out of sight. I couldn't do that because of that. 
I was the villain. I was deficient. I was the one who was failing because I couldn't tell when I should lie and when I should tell the truth. But I'm not like that. I'm autistic. The truth comes naturally to me. And I really stumble when I try to lie. So I don't. But that became the instant where me being autistic actually became a problem that could not be sustained with an employer. Yes. Now, as it happens, I managed to ride through that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I stayed working for that employer for some time because I managed to get past it in the end. But my God, that was a difficult year of my life. This idea that, that normal is what we should all aspire to be is simply about standardization of human beings as a labor unit. Yeah. And if we don't fit into that, that, that easy category of labor unit that does what it's told, when it's told, in the way that it's told, tells the truth that it's told to tell, but tells the lies that it's told to tell as well, that is willing to accept whatever the uh, current authority figure throws at you to believe, then you're fine. But if you don't, live up to that in any way you're seen as being deficient not just different deficient and that's what we're fighting against and the dsm and the icd are so heavily biased around that kind of idea that you should be a productive member of society you should be earning money for somebody otherwise you're failing that's where not only ourselves but the the entire disability community is thrown under the bus not just for people who can't earn, but people who are perfectly capable of earning, but just can't do it under the, the, the situation and the standards that we're expected to at the moment. It's, it's such a huge can of worms. But if we were to move away from that de deficiency model and move towards a diversity model, yes, it would make the world a much better and happier place, and it would make life easier for us. But the threat to those who profit the most from it Will be significant and that's why there will always be resistance to it um we live in very strange times at the moment politically and i think that reflects very heavily on our own struggle um Yuan's always saying that it's political and he's absolutely right because you can't take the politics out of it where diversity comes into it whatever kind of diversity politics enters the fray no matter what you do and i've just ranted for five minutes so i'll, I'll give way to somebody else now that's Brilliant, Quinn, brilliant. Uh, and this is what uh, I'm now referring to as, well, at the, I'm trying to boil things down to first principles where things are going wrong. And you can explain it all in terms of these power gradients as I sort of alluded to earlier. And I, I think a good language to refer to this is that we've actually, what civilization has done is we've, what I now call powered up relationships. So by powered up, I mean made them competitive, where um, relationships are about the question of who can dominate whom. And so by powering up relationships, and we've now got like 10,000 years of experience with this, unfortunately, and very quickly on that pathway, yeah, we have developed things like money. And so this has become very sort of ubiquitous in, in, in all these civilized cultures. And this is where things got, get starting fundamentally problematic. Yes, uh, deception is something that is seen as being very fundamental to civilization. It's seen as, uh, it also ties in with a sort of, uh, um, well, perverted view of what evolution is, right? That evolution is the sort of competitive fight against each other. Um, what is forgotten is that actually the, the, um, the main sort of, uh, organism within human society is we're not individual organisms, but it's these small groups like hunter gatherers. I mean, that's a use the kind of unit that uh, actually where people collaborate and it's you can only understand human collective behavior by looking at these small groups. And what you find is that in these small groups, not only uh, are the norms all about being collaborative and assisting each other, uh, it goes beyond that. It's even that these small groups uh, between themselves, they even have collaborative relationships between groups because they know that you can learn from each other, right? It's competition only enters the picture, uh, yeah, with things like agriculture. And once um, you end up in sort of uh, situations where, well, you, you need to have a culture somewhere where uh, powered up relationships are considered 
normal or desirable. And then if you add to this uh, perhaps resource constraints that uh, force people to compete, um, then you have a dangerous mix. And I think this is probably how civilization got started at some point. Uh, and we need to now step back because uh, we've got an overpopulated planet. We, have, uh, we are destroying all other species. Um, we have to find ways of uh, working and living together again um, without working against each other and then calling that progress. So this idea of um, pretending, competing, um, lying, these different words have been brought up, right? Um, and I'm thinking about power and privilege and masking. And I'm thinking about how um, from the moment that we're born, things like eye contact, things like, you know, normal, whatever that normal is, um, it, it, we're conditioned to try and meet these criteria that don't even exist. And um, when, when we're involved in conversations with, um, with families, again, from a school perspective, often the biggest fear is not about accepting their child the way they are. It's often about what happens if I can't get my child to blend into this notion of normal because then that child, and they might be three, four, five, or they might be 12, 13, 14 or older, um, because obviously as, as we hit every major change, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, I know it's different across the world, but different divisions of schooling, there are different bumps. And when you're preparing for these different transitions, these anxieties come up amongst parents and grownups at home because their worry is that they have to backwards plan from employability and meeting the um, structures and the expectations of the getting a job, the, the looking at people in the eye when they do job interviews, which is a big problem for me. Um, all of these things that they're afraid their child or children are being going to be judged again, uh, judged for things like stimming, you know, many families are trying to quash stimming or trying to force mouth speak because that is what's seen by society to be the right way to do things and they're also experiencing this dissonance because we have major service providers, billion dollar industries, behaviorist models that are trying to help force kids to change and, and, and submit to, um, you know, changing who they are, ignoring their authentic selves, ignoring their authentic needs to look like somebody else so they'll fit in. But really, if we were to change our systems, we have to do things backwards, really. We have to change our systems, right? In order for our kids to feel like they can accept themselves. And the thing, I think right now, um, this is partly why the summit that's coming up is so important because if we can get as many parents, guardians, carers in um, to the, the, the summit that, that we've got going on starting just in a couple of days, they will start to see that there are lots of people out there like their child or children. And there are lots of people out there willing to embrace and um, you know, help them find themselves. And the difference we're seeing in little people who have connected uh, and embraced their identity as a neurodivergent person, when they have role models and mentors that with whom they can identify as in any group who's been marginalized, the difference is immense because they're growing up seeing themselves represented, seeing that stimming is normal, seeing that they can use AAC, seeing that, um, you know, moving around or standing while they're working and all of these things are okay. Um, but then we have, you know, those that don't, many of us who grew up trying to fit in and figure out, figuring out who we were and figuring, it's interesting because that survey that just came out from Chris Bonello, one of those things, right? One of those, and I was so excited about that. One of those things had to do with many of us knew that we just didn't fit in for some reason. We didn't know why, but we knew there was something we just didn't fit in. And, and this is part of that. So if, if kids are growing up knowing they don't fit in and they're being forced to suppress that, 
suppress anything that makes them not fit in, um, we're just creating an entire traumatized uh, population of people on top of the other traumas. So when we have a, a criteria that's been socially constructed, because really that's what it is, a criteria that's socially constructed based on a deficit model is just perpetuating that problem. It's just saying, you have a problem, here's why, check the box, give you this treatment, and off you go, try and be um, a normal person, do what you can. And that's not what we need to be doing, right? So, but, but there is, I do experience dissonance as an educational professional because our systems are not, it's like we're in this zone where our systems are not ready for authenticity. And so if we say, absolutely, 100% neurodiversity paradigm model um, existence, embrace it, um, how do we get, how do we press the button and there suddenly be full embracing of that? Because our systems aren't ready. Our knowledge base amongst the general population is not there. And we're asking people to come out in, in this other way um, and embrace themselves and normalize stimming and, and all of that. But we have to make sure that our systems are ready. We have to make sure our systems will actually employ, will actually accept, will actually promote and amplify and celebrate. And, and that's, that's the rub. <laughs> But it has to go beyond that as well, though, Carrie. I, I, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. We need to look at it from a, um, a, a social and societal point of view as well. I, I'll give me an example of, of why I say this. is um, I've, I've, I've not been um, working in the office since COVID started, since the first lockdown here. Um, I've been lucky to be able to work from home since uh, things started up again. Um, but... When I was uh, in the office, there were a lot of these training courses turn up. I did one um, a while ago, which I thought I'd see what their view of it was. It was a dealing with difficult people course. Um, and it didn't teach me anything new because I've been dealing with difficult people all my life. Um, but nonetheless, my, myself and another chap there who's a bit younger than me, hit it off straight away. and. I thought to myself, yeah, I know what's going on here. He didn't know anything himself. I wasn't out in the open at that point. So we dropped it. But then after I did, if you like, come out at work, um, he approached me one day and told me that he was seeking diagnosis. Um, he's been thinking that he might be autistic for some time and had seen his GP and got the referral. And then I saw him a few weeks later, we worked on different sides of the site, um, asked him how it was going, had he got a date yet? And he told me that he told the doctor to stop it. Why? But you were so excited. You know, you, you thought, thought you had an explanation for why you'd always had difficulty like this. You thought maybe that was why you and I clicked just like that. You know, I, I, why are you not doing it? Because his girlfriend had threatened him that if he got a diagnosis as autistic, she would leave him. Because as far as she's concerned, he can be the same person. But if he's got that piece of paper, if he's got that, that word hanging over him, she didn't want to be associated with him. So no matter what we do on, a, on an official level, if we can't get over that kind of prejudice that, that, that says that the same person is viable boyfriend material or not, dependent on whether they've got the word autistic attached to them, if we don't change that, then it doesn't matter what we do on the other side of things, we're still not going to get very far. So we need to work on every front. We need to work on reducing the stigma on a social level, but we have to work on the institutions at the same time. And you know, educators are in a great position to do that. Sadly, um, you know, I know it's, it's a different system, but um, whether you're talking that the USA, Canada, New Zealand or the UK, all educators are bound by a, a curriculum of sorts of, of expected things that they should teach. And that increasingly there are things coming along, sometimes through legislation that you're not allowed to talk about. You know, thinking about all the, the, the don't say gay bills and the like that we've been hearing about a lot in the US. It, it's, it's terrifying the power that is out there that's being exercised against the idea of diversity of difference of 
depathologizing things which really aren't worthy of pathologization in the first place so we have got to work on so many fronts at the same time yeah. but that's where we have the strength that there are so many spiky skill sets to to fall back on and we all have different strengths um i've tried to make the best of my strengths i know we all are here and making the best of the positions we've got but it really does take a concerted effort and everybody not only wanting the same thing but but saying the same things not because we're told to but because we all agree on those things and that consensus is what will take us forward but it's spreading that consensus getting away from the fear that some people have of joining in because they think of the autistic community as being dogmatic and insular and uh, full of people who jump down their throat for saying the wrong word. That's not what it's like, but it's easy to get that impression, particularly if you're coming into it from the point of view of somebody who's already battered in the first place, because let's face it, anybody who's seeking diagnosis is doing so because they recognize that they don't fit they're already battered. They've already been through that trauma that you mentioned before, and it may be ongoing. And if they don't get the instant welcome they want from us, they may turn away because they may think we're just as bad as the rest of them, maybe even worse, because we're supposed to be the good guys. So we have to make sure we keep that good guy face out there as often as possible at all times to our own, to um, neurotypicals, to everybody. We have to be seen to be accommodating and friendly and open and honest. And when they're not, when they deceive us or when they stab us in the backs, they're the ones who are going to expose themselves, not us. We, we, we sadly have to be whiter than white in the you know, non-racial sense of the word to be able to get our point across. We have to be pure as the driven snow. There must be... I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. You can say, see... We're, with the direction I'm going in there, but it, we have to be very strong in showing a united front, but also a welcoming front. Yeah, something like that. Thank you, Quinn. I think we're running out of time, and this is a wonderful conversation here. So I hope we can have further conversations of this kind. Um, and yes, I would fully support what you're saying. Uh, we need to rebuild or recreate um, societies that are built on well, mutual trust and trustworthy relationships, collaboration. And the way to get there is with openness and honesty. Those are the key qualities that we need. And it's actually very easy to, I think, go down this path because if you've got a group of people who embrace those norms, then um, in this hyper-competitive, deceptive society, uh, we uh, are in an excellent position because people realize this very quickly that uh, this, what we're doing is, is very different from what society is currently teaching people, which is actually yeah, traumatizing everyone, right? And it's become very obvious for vast numbers of people that uh, something is wrong. They just can't point their, their finger on exactly what is wrong. And that's where I think we've got an opportunity just to explain this to people in a way that they can relate to. So thanks, everyone. This has been absolutely wonderful, marvelous. Uh, and we've been going for, I think, over one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so if anyone has any closing words, please and maybe Stellan, you want to comment because you are, I think, still sort of in the education system, sort of at the receiving end. It maybe it makes sense to, to hand over to you. Um, I've kind of just been sponging and absorbing the stuff that people are saying. Um, so I don't know if I have a lot of crystallized thoughts at the moment, but. Um, it's been really great to hear that there are other people thinking, other people out there in the world thinking similar things and having similar conversations to like the things we're talking about and thinking about here at Landmark. Um, and I think something that's becoming apparent to me in this conversation, not that I didn't realize it before, but things are just so big and the systemic issues are so large that it's going to take a lot of work to really change that. Um, 
So I think I'm just feeling how large and like daunting it is right now. Um, but I think if we don't acknowledge that we have no shot at making any changes. So um, I think it's really important to be aware of what we're dealing with. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. Well, Thank you. Rome wasn't built in a day, but it took an awful lot of bricklayers and an awful lot of trowels. If we're all willing to pick up our tools and do what's necessary, we'll get there. Yeah. Very good. So thank you all for your time. This has been wonderful. And um, yeah, we'll put this, uh, publish this on, on the Autistic Collaboration website. And as I like to say, Autistic Collaboration is autistic joy. We need more of that. Take care. Thank, right. thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Looking forward to future uh, meetings. This was great. Hi, everyone. Good to meet everyone.